kind of a broad topic, integrating web applications. Uh, wanted to kind of talk about Ruby and web and how things go and architecture and stuff. And so that's what we'll get started with today. Um, so I want to start with kind of how we got here. Big picture for me anyway. For, for me, Ruby in 2005 was Rails. And uh, Rails in 2005 for me was how to write a blog in 10 minutes, how to build another to-do app. Uh, a lot of just kind of uh, simple models. Uh, we were kind of celebrating the, uh, the uh, uh, He's distracting me. <laughs> uh, so you know, kind of celebrating the the ORM and 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 you know, building building web apps that have just a sprinkle of AJAX in them. They were pretty simple back then, at least for me. And um, and Rails was a lot of just about uh, trying to get our co code organized back then. 2010. I, uh, last night I did a, just a Google search, uh, looking for tutorials on Rails 3. Some of the things that were coming up were Bundler, Active Relation, Active Model. You know, uh, Bundler, you know, is because there's so much going on in the Ruby community, uh, dependencies and issues and, and things. It's, it's complex. We've got to kind of simplify it with Bundler. Uh, active model to, to kind of to, to modularize things, like the relation. Um, some really neat things that are more about integration, more about big, more about there's more going on. Our, our applications are more comp complex than they used to be. Um, at our company, Fleet Ventures, uh, we're building a video, video rendering uh, application in the browser uh, with Rails. We're, we're building a, a system that, that uh, works through the, um, the patent application process, uh, does major uh, document parsing and, and machine learning on that, uh, do lots of medical records, uh, coding in, 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 the, in the browser uh, for medical records. Um, just kind of complex stuff that we do now. It's, uh, we've come a long ways from just, just uh, uh, simple apps. And, and the problem I'm having with that sometimes is I make, or I start with big monolithic apps, uh, tough to, you know, big, big Rails apps, big, big apps that have lots of models and lots of gems and lots of dependencies. And um, uh, in 2008, Justin Getland spoke at RailsConf. It was about something almost similar. And his talk was called uh, Small Things Loosely Joined Written Fast. And the concept was if we architect things smarter, we get more done with less resources, we can maintain it better, it's better code. And that's, I think, kind of the trick with integrating web apps and um, going smaller, going simpler, uh, using other services, don't try to be everything, solve one problem in one context and go on and do a different problem in a different context. And, and there's a lot of ways to do that. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, like I was saying, um, I've learned the hard way sometimes with these big apps. And so coming back and refactoring things, um, I'm learning to use web services. And so there's kind of three, three basic areas um, I think that make sense. Um, internal systems, you know, we're building internal web, web systems, external systems, and open systems. So I'll kind of break it out that way. Um, so internal systems are basically you control what you're doing. Maybe you have a big monolithic app. Maybe you just think that you're going to reuse some code, or maybe it's just easier to do something smaller. Um, at the RailsConf this year, uh, they, they, there was a, a company that uh, had built um, a learning management solution. And their talk was entitled, I just saw the, 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 the uh, slides, but um, they used 30 Rails apps to build this. They just kept it really modular internally, and they were able to keep things kind of the way they, they like to. Um, so internally, if you control everything, you can build your applications in a, in a simple way, and you can just have a, a simple decoupled system. Maybe your search, you know, maybe um, five or six models all bundled up that make sense together, um, that you, you, you build smaller apps. Um, it's cool in the Ruby world to use RESTful, uh, RESTful Connections that's been around for a few years. Um, basically a, a typical Rails controller, like you guys all know, um, that allowed the URL to kind of tell you what you're, what you're after. So you can create, read, update, and delete your basic models through um, REST commands. Um, I'll go into that just a little bit. Um, and I think that if you're going to go from scratch and it's not already a Rails app or a Merv app or something, um, stick with Sinatra. 
it's really easy. I'll, I'll show you how easy. And there's a lot of ways to consume it. Um, REST client's kind of the easiest way as well. Um, so here's a Sinatra app. Um, require a bunch of libraries more than you typically do, but I did because I did. And uh, but basically, you have to require Ruby Gems, require Sinatra. That's what you need. Um, so the rest of this, I was using Data Mapper in this, um, and I use Bundler to keep it clean. But basically, um, you need to require Sinatra, and then um, I required some local libraries. I set up the database, but the bottom line there, the post documents is just one method. It's a RESTful interface for creating a document, and uh, it just creates a document in in the database. And so that's one page. It's a web service. It's local. It's easy. It's it's simple. It's a haiku. And uh, with that, you can go and store and save a document. And if you put another 20 or 30 lines, you could view them and download them and update them and, and all kinds of things or do related things. And, and you could imagine, you know, if you had 20 or 30 little uh, methods in there for anything you wanted to do to a document, pretty soon you've got a web service that does just documents, uploads and handles documents. And now you've got probably a good start to a, an internal web service that's going to do a good job. Um, and uh, we actually kind of started this last night. We're going to get to this in about two weeks here at work, uh, uh, where this will actually grow into a real web service that we're using, uh, where we're going to do a lot of behind the scenes work on these documents um, you know, in a message queue system, and just having a simple Sinatra web app to get it in and out and get things started is all we needed. So. That's what that is. And then to consume it, it's even easier. Um, the way I did it just was from the command line. Um, but REST client, uh, if you just sudo gem install or gem install REST client, um, you'll get um, a lot of tools. And it does a lot of smart things for you. And that's kind of why I like REST client. Um, here I just said REST client. I gave it kind of a base URL. And I'm just running, I was running the Sinatra app locally. And so I called that method, that post documents. and uh, I named it and and actually sent a file. I opened a, a file and REST client smart enough to know that that's a multi-part submission. Yes. This client is a gem or is it? It's a gem. Yes. So that's that's a binary that comes with it. It is. Yes. Yeah, so it's a binary that comes with the gem. There's usually you'd use it like in one of your other apps or in a class or something, and you can just do capital R REST, capital C client, and uh, it's really easy documentation. Um, the reason I like it is because it's easy. Um, but right there, it, it handled multi-part uploading. It loaded it and created a document in my database. And it's just that easy. And so if you control the, the consuming and the producing, if you use REST client plus Sinatra, that's probably the easiest way. Um, with Rails, there's a little bit of um, you know, uh, things you're thinking about, uh, protect from forgery, uh, some configurations you're thinking about authentication. Um, so you're a little bit more involved. Sometimes if you already have the Rails app, though, it's worth it. Um, you already usually have it in the right format, ready to, ready to consume and produce. So, um, so internal systems, breaking up your systems may be a thing to do. Um, definitely if, if, if a, a product's getting too, too complicated. Um, there we go. Um, external systems um, are everything else all the Web 2.0 stuff that we all consume. And we probably all consumed them with our Ruby apps, um, or they're not hard to do. Um, the basic way, you usually start just an adapter and API. Um, if you have to, you might custom build something. And um, there's a cool stuff. I, I, I'm starting to realize that Data Mapper can be really, really powerful for web services. Um, so wrappers and APIs, there's kind of for everything, something already, usually. Um, I just checked this morning. Um, on GitHub, um, I was looking actually the results, and they all looked like they were wrappers. Or a lot of these were 18, 1,831 wrappers or so in Ruby um, on GitHub um, today. Um, and uh, pretty much anything and everything you want to do, all the all the web docs, all the web web applications that you might want to consume and use and bring them in, and they're usually really basic. You know, you you look at the documentation. There's usually a class. There's usually a key. It's usually an hour or two to get a, a web service integrated to what you're doing. Um, and so that's not too bad. Um, every once in a while, you'll find something you just don't like the wrappers, you just don't like the APIs, you don't have one. 
So you have to custom build it. Um, Ruby's got some good groundwork that we can start with with that. Um, XML RPC and SOAP are both part of the standard library. And so you can do different styles of, of consuming services that way. Um, if you're doing really old school stuff, EDI stuff, um, they have these standards, uh, these documents that are these piped limited documents that they come up with 20 years ago or so. And they, they run a lot of industry. A lot of the medical world that we work with uses X12 uh, to talk between different entities. And so there's an X12 parser that looks pretty good, Ruby, Ruby Jam. Uh, for several years now, Active Resource has allowed us to uh, uh, consume uh, RESTful resources. Um, if they're out there and there's not a good, good wrapper or a good, good anything there, you can bring it into your, your Rails app or your anything using Active Record. Um, an Active Model um, is is a way that it's not really about web services, but it's kind of about making your your plain Jane Ruby Ruby classes kind of look almost like an Active Record. You know, validations and callbacks and some of those those state management things you can kind of add. So that's a Rails 3 thing with Active Model. So there's not a lot I, I can say about how to do that except for you just do it. But something that I was realizing as, as I was doing it is, is a way to simplify it, at least for me, for things, is um, the data mapper adapters are incredibly powerful. Um, data mapper is really, really, really modular. And uh, they did a great job of extracting out the adapter. And if you've got an adapter, you've got all your finding all of your associating, all your validating, all of your everything is there. And, and to, to create an adapter, you have to uh, write four methods, create, read, update, and delete. And they give you, um, with a couple lines of code, you have 41 specs already running against your adapter. So basically, you set up the specs, you've got 41 things to get right in four methods. Once you have that, you have an adapter. Um, so what we're looking at right now is a, an adapter DM Salesforce that was written for Salesforce. So Salesforce is a web service, uh, kind of an ERP type solution for customer relationship management. Um, and uh, they developed what looks like to a lot of you guys, uh, that's just a, a class, like a data mapper regular class. It's, um, uh, they set up the repository to use the Salesforce. You can have a, a backend database in your app and you can have a Salesforce backend here. And here's an account that's, that's they define just the properties they were interested in. And then over here they have a contact and they uh, connect the contact to the account and then they consume it and use it just like it was, just like it was in the database. So this is a web service that's running like it was just part of your app. So it's like you wrote Salesforce. So really powerful. So kind of an art to that, um, but I think really uh, powerful um, way to approach web services. Um, so that's kind of the external things. Now, uh, real quick before I jump into open resources, um, kind of the art of it, um, as I've used web services, there's sometimes latency issues. Um, the way I usually get around that is I ask for something asynchronously, either in the back end or I get the web page up if I'm needing to view it and then I ask uh, in the background to get it and I just have a, a JavaScript listener, you know, to tell the user when we're ready to go. Uh, so that we can kind of fudge a little bit on how long it may or may not take to get data from a, from a web service because maybe it's slow that day or maybe it's down or whatever. So I kind of decouple that and that's important, I think. Um, also, other things that you deal with when you're doing uh, external web services is some of the authentication security issues. Um, I haven't found any general rules of thumb for that. Um, just every time I work on it, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more about that than, than maybe if I'm just building my own little app. Um, but open resources is another web service um, that works today. This is kind of a, a web 1.0 and a web 3.0 examples um, here for open resources. Um, sometimes it there just isn't an API. Sometimes there just isn't a way to wrap anything. Um, there's just data on an HTML page, and so you've got to scrape it. Um, I haven't done any scraping for about a year, um, but I had quite a big project. I had a, a client who, who needed their data from their, their own supplier, and they couldn't provide it in a useful way, and so we ended up scraping the supplier's site. And um, it was important we got it right, and so I ended up using a uh, mechanized and HPCOT to get things done. Um, the structure I ended up doing was I tried to treat all the pieces of the external website like classes and methods and try to group it up. So I used OpenStruct, OpenStruct a lot. And, um, and so here's an example. I, I just try to basically bring it down to 
uh, the level almost like it's a, a local method call. And that way I can run tests. And I thought I found, it turned out it was important that I wrote tests because things change out there when you're scraping websites. And so having tests around, uh, tell me whether or not my scrapers still work is important. Um, so this is one where I just set up a few variables and then I just call something in the, in the class to start asserting data that should be sitting in the document that I just created. So I tried to just treat it like, uh, like regular, like it was a class in my library, like it was local. And, um, and that was, I guess, the biggest thing I learned from, from that experience. Um, but the issue we have, even Web 1.0, 1.2.0, API or not, is there's a lot out there. It's exponential and it's growing. It's growing exponentially. And uh, you can't keep up. If you're thinking about it, you're, you've got a web service out there. And um, every time there's a web service, they've got to develop an API, and then somebody's got to write a wrapper, and then you've got to adapt to that wrapper. There's a lot of work every time you want to use something. And um, you don't usually tie into a whole lot of things, but there is another way. Um, turns out, and this isn't for me, I was listening to a guy in London uh, talk about linked data. And turns out that Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, a few months before he even coined the phrase World Wide Web, he was talking about linked data and talking about Web 3.0 stuff. And, uh, and kind of the idea that um, a, a resource or a link on, online should actually relate to something concrete and be semantically discernible is, is kind of what I'm saying in a funny way. But maybe a simpler way to say it is uh, link data, some suggestions to make link data work for you is uh, name things with URIs. And go ahead and make those URIs point to real HTTP pages, something you could actually go consume and look at. So if it's new, you created it, um, go ahead and publish that. You know, put it on a web service somewhere. So, uh, and when you do that, put something useful there, something about what you're talking about. So if we're talking about this web conference, um, we might just make up our own link, a, a URI that might, might re refer to it, that has some RDF behind it or whatever, and just make something useful, or just point to, you know, uh, convert maybe the, the main conference website a little bit to have link data on there. And then um, finally, link to other related information so people can traverse it. And it's really interesting, because if you stay simple with link data, um, it gets really, really powerful. Uh, because now your database is the, the web, the whole web. Everything that's using RDF and linked data and these ontologies and the kind of infrastructure that we've been building up for quite a few years. And, uh, and so now web services don't have to mean an API, they don't have to mean something that you spent time building a wrapper for or learning the API for or anything like that. It can just be something you can go out there and discover. Uh, one of the most powerful things I ever saw with, with this stuff was uh, six lines of code, application, it asked, what is the relationship between a fox and a cow? And the answer got back was they both have uh, commercially uh, viable pelts or, or coats, uh, furs, skins, that's whatever it is. <laughs> they, they, and, and it figured it out. And it was what they did was they asked the USDA, the USDA had published this huge RDF database with all this information and it just looked for what's the most relevant way these things link. And so it's really, really powerful if you start to, to explore and look around and things. Wikipedia, um, a lot of Wikipedia has been converted to another system called uh, DBpedia, uh, which is all the RDF information for the same thing. If they can extract links out and meaning out of the things you're looking at at Wik Wikipedia, it's there. Uh, the BBC has got major commitments to that. Other huge, huge resources that have amazing amounts of, of data you can consume and information you can consume, you can relate to your own web services. Um, in the Ruby world, turns out we have some pretty good ways of doing that as well. Um, Gem install RDF, RDF Raptor, RDF JSON, RDF Tricks, and Sp Spira. Uh, RDF Raptor is sometimes a bit uh, involved. Um, uh, there's a good link for getting through all this. There, there's some, a really good blog that's, that's, that's keeping this RDF RV stuff all intact. They're not very active writing, but when they write, they write really well um, about this stuff. And then so if you, if you install all that stuff and you just uh, maybe start an IRB, um, console up and require your RDF, RDF, and triples maybe in Spira. Just a little simple application here. I, I added a graph from this external resource. I consumed a web service and for everything in there I just uh, put the, the node that was out there. 
and a bunch of gobbledygook, but it's real in there. It's uh, information about Jay Hacker, his name and his, and, and a lot of things about him. Um, and, and that's okay, that's useful, that's a start. Uh, Spira is a little bit more exciting. Uh, it feels more like a model and it's a little newer. Uh, you create your repo, same repo as what we had in the last example. You add the re repository to Spira and then you go ahead and create a simple model. And on this model, I just said, hey, there's two properties I'm interested in. There's about 10 on, on a, it, what it's doing is conforming to an ontology called FOF, a uh, friend of a friend. And so it already tells you, we already know that it's gonna have name and nick in there and it's gonna have other things in there too, account and things like that. But we just said, well, all I wanna know, since I'm gonna be using these people, um, is their name and their nickname. But you could set more things up. And you see over here the predicate FOF name. It, it's basically saying, I can go look through this data and figure out what we're looking at. And I go ahead and I instantiate jhacker to um, uh, some URI that's out there and I say it's as a person or as this model I just, that we have there. And then we go grab the name and the nickname. We can save it, we can change it, we can treat it like a model. So there's no API that we had to learn extra. There was no extra service we had to run through. There was no new connection we had to deal with. And so, um, it's a lot better if it's available to you know consume web services and kind of what they're calling the Web 3.0 way. Um, so that's the basic ideas I had for uh, web services and integrating web apps, uh, kind of a broad topic. Um, kind of fun and embarrassing. Uh, last night as I checked my blog, uh, it's down. So fleetventures.com, uh, we'll figure that out, debug that today. But uh, I put about 50 or 60 links uh, on the blog there uh, that tied everything I talked to. Uh, probably take you two, three hundred hours to find all that information of the same stuff. So if you if you wanted to to kind of think about that, there's there's some good stuff to to work with. So thank you very much.